Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, a particular variety of music came to prominence, a, a genre that forms the foundation of blues and gospel music today. Uh, it was a particularly controversial style of music called the Negro Spiritual. Now, these songs are incredible, right? Uh, you may have a picture in your mind of your favourites, whether it's Go Tell It On The Mountain or Nobody Knows The Trouble I've Seen or When The Saints Go Marching In. I mean, these songs are evocative and timeless. They were particularly controversial uh, in the slave states in the Civil War because uh, although many of them had like a biblical theme, such as the stories of Moses or Daniel, they also spoke of the struggles uh, the African-American people had. See, they applied those biblical narratives to their everyday experience. They could see themselves in those stories. A and that uh, applicability, I think, is why, part of why some of these songs are just so timeless. To the point where today we still use them in everything from footy club songs to advertising to kids' church. I mean, we see ourselves in the story. Take, for example, this one. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Jericho, I'm not going to sing it. Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Uh, as I was preparing this, my daughter Sarah looked into it. She goes, she started singing it for me. I should have got her out here to sing it. Uh, I learned this one growing up. A and it sticks with you. It stuck with Sarah. First, because it's catchy. And secondly, because of the story that you're taught. Uh, you see yourself in the story and, and it teaches you an important life lesson that God loves you and he's on your side. And, and that when uh, you come against an enemy that is just too powerful for you to handle by yourself, you have nothing to fear. And that's an important lesson because there's nothing untrue in any of that. But because of the catchy tune and the inbuilt kids church lesson, many of us get a rude shock when we become adults and we read the rest of the story. Here it is. So the people shouted and the priests blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city and every man straight ahead and they took the city. They utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. It's brutal, isn't it? Massacre. Genocide. <laughs> crusade. <laughs> carnage. One of the things I'm hoping to make clear for you through this series is this idea that God is a God who is not just characterized by grace, but is actually grace. Yet, if you take a moment uh, to not skip by this, this violent and bloody scene... And just kind of imagine what was going on. You might just get a sense why people struggle to reconcile God in the Old Testament with God in the New Testament. You can see how some reject the Old Testament God as somehow being less than the loving, compassionate God of the New Testament. The contrasting images of God in the Old and God in the New, they create a very real tension for many people. And you may even be one of them. <laughs> And I don't want to insult you by like trying to explain them away. The fact of the matter is this, that God is both terrifying and merciful. He's terrifying and merciful. God both punishes sin and extends grace to sinners. See, while it would be really convenient for me to sit here and try to tell you that the God in the Old Testament, the God in the New Testament are somehow different, that leaves me drawing a picture of a God that I am comfortable with. And friends, that's always a mistake. But believing uh, that they are one and the same, well, that leaves people like me who do what I do with some explaining to do. We are in this series called creatively entitled Grace, where we're talking about undeserved, unearned, unearnable favour. Grace. And the reason I want to talk about this in the run-up to Easter is because I know for many of us, grace is a struggle. For some of us, it's a struggle to receive grace because we were taught that if you're given something good, it's only because you earned it. Like you have to work hard to get something good. There's no other way. For others of us, it's a struggle for us to give because 
the people who do us wrong, the people who have hurt us or they've taken something from us, well, they got to pay, right? But this is important because the church is most appealing when grace is most apparent. Because our world, and probably your world, is filled with people who are not Jesus followers. Or perhaps were once Jesus followers. Because they encountered someone or something, usually in the church, that lacked grace. And like I said last week, a version of Christianity that is built on a misunderstanding of grace leaves us feeling as if grace, well, it's just a weakness. It's permissive. It's unjust. It's just not fair. (laughs) And that's actually true. Grace is not fair. Grace is actually better than fair. It's grace. But it's brutal events like this one that unsettle people as they bump up against faith. Events like this that seem so brutal and unfair. Events that seem far removed from our idea of a gracious God. So, stories like the destruction of Jericho, I think, demand some sort of explanation. But to do that, you're going to need to stick with us because we need some context. Some 650 years before this account takes place, God gave a man named Abraham a promise, a covenant in fact, that he would become the father of a great nation. You may be familiar with it. And that his descendants would receive the land of Canaan as an inheritance. That's why it's called the promised land. However, the part of the promise that doesn't get mentioned much in our preaching uh, is that is this, that God also predicted that as part of this process, not only would they become a great nation, oh, sorry, they would become a great nation, not in Canaan, but in Egypt. Here's what God said to Abram, as recorded in Genesis. He says, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that's not theirs, where they'll be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I'll also judge the nation whom they will serve, And afterwards, they'll come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, Abraham, Abram, and you'll be buried at a good old age. And that's exactly what happened. Abraham died, and after he did, his descendants eventually flourished. A story we read as a church through the first portion of this year in Exodus. And eventually they blossomed into a nation of around two and a half million people. It's astonishing. In that same time frame, the text tells us that a new pharaoh who did not know Joseph had come to power. See, 400 years is a long time. Four generations, in fact. And Moses led the Israelites to settle in the promised land, essentially bringing them to settle. That land, however, didn't stay vacant, right? Abraham's former neighbours saw the land and saw an opportunity. They took up residence. They developing into more than a dozen distinct cultures. And although they took a little while to get there, uh, the, the nation of Israel, and for those familiar with the story, yes, I just did skip over the entire 40 years of wilderness wandering. Here Israel stand on the banks of the Jordan River. And they realised, hey, there's someone living in our spot. How many of you know the promises of God always contain like a barrier or two, like something standing in the way that makes you wonder, huh, was this really the plan? Nevertheless, here's Israel coming back to take the land. Now, we often think in terms uh, of what Israel were facing. But if you spared a thought for those who were working the land, (laughs) those who were there, those who'd moved in, the Canaanites, they were left with three options. Option number one, they could move out, leave everything they'd worked hard to build, which, you know, it kind of seems unlikely. Did I mention 400 years is a really long time? Second option, they could drop everything and devote all their resources and divert all their resources to stay and fight. Or number three, they could surrender and become Israel's slaves. They could become what Israel were to Egypt. <laughs> not, much of, uh, not many options, right? They're brutal. And this is one of those things that seems so odd through our modern lens. A nation leaves and they forfeit their right, right? Like they just left. Finders keepers. They don't just get to waltz in and take it back. To our mind, that just seems so unfair, so unjust and so ungracious. And then when you consider that God would orchestrate this kind of land grab, doesn't seem very loving, doesn't seem very gracious. In the middle of that promise to Abraham, there's 
there's a twist that kind of helps to explain it. It's important not to skip past it because it actually paints a picture for what's coming. Here it is. Then in the fourth generation, they'll return here, the people of Israel, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Another version puts it this way. The sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. See, the thing I didn't mention when I said that Abraham's neighbors took up residence in Canaan was that not only did they take up residence and work the land, and build cities and do all that stuff, they established cultures that were abominable, even by ancient standards. Uh, the Amorites, these guys were powerful warriors, like the height of cedars, uh, the prophet Amos said. And they had very little or no regard for human life. They, although they er- worshipped Amaru, some sort of storm god, they also worshipped a vast array of idols. They had some of the most perverted practices imaginable, including incest, bestiality and child sacrifice. They weren't just building like nice little lives for themselves in the land left behind by the sons of Israel. They were building themselves a culture that was unredeemable. Not the people, the culture. And so at the time God gave Abraham his promise, their sin or their perversion had not yet reached its full measure. Why didn't God wipe them out straight away? Like at the first sign of that sort of a perversion, a wickedness. Why didn't he just swat them and start again, leaving the ra- land ripe for the picking for his chosen people? Well, it's because although he's just, God is slow to judge. We're going to circle back around to that. So they were pretty bad, the Amorites. But even if they deserved that, David, how would they know, right? I mean, they had no rule of law over them. They may not have even known that their practices were uh, objectionable or abominable to God. Think about all that, though. I mean, all throughout the Old Testament, we find accounts of all different sorts of cultures through all different sorts of times being sent a prophet, a messenger of God. Like, think Jeremiah's warning to God's people. Or perhaps even a better example, Jonah to the city of Nineveh. It's a stretch, I think, to believe that God would not have warned the Amorites. And although we don't know if they received a warning, I think they probably did, we don't know that for sure. But what we do know is that God was paying attention and, (laughs) fair to say, wasn't a huge fan of what was going on. So by the time Israel crossed the Jordan, the sin, the depravity and the perversion of the Amorites must have reached its full measure. Because Israel were actually sent with strict instructions, not just to conquer, but to cleanse and to not even plunder the spoils of war. Like the whole point of this war was not gain, but a do-over, like a whole clean slate. And to us, that sounds very far removed from the God that we grew up with, uh, the, the, the love of the world so much that he gave us his only begotten son. And it leaves God open to that criticism that we read last week from Richard Dawkins, who accused Yahweh of being an ethnic cleanser. Like, it sounds extreme. But then again, the effect of sin on the world was more extreme. Everything in the world was broken, contaminated by sin. And God was establishing a nation, a nation that was to be like no other. A nation that would introduce the means by which grace would be offered to every tribe, nation, and tongue. God took precautions and he set some guardrails to ensure that this fledgling nation of Israel was not influenced by the cultures that now surrounded them. It was crucial that this nation got off to a good start. Although Joshua had not encountered a siege on his campaign so far, he was now an accomplished and experienced enough to do recon on the fortified city of Jericho. So he sent spies in, and and posing as travellers, they found room and board within the city walls with, with a prostitute named Rahab. Now, I don't know if they weren't good spies, although... Jericho wasn't a huge city. Like archaeologists estimate that the walls enclosed only around eight and a half acres. So perhaps it was just they were from out of town and they were noticed. But they were noticed. 
And word of their presence soon reached the king of Jericho, who demanded that Rahab turn in her Hebrew house guests. <laughs> Imagine the scene. The spies are hiding when there's an intimidating knock on the door. Where are they? And Rahab, Rahab flat out lies to protect them. In doing so, putting herself in danger. Like if they had been discovered there, if they had discovered her lie, she almost certainly would have been put to death. How nervous would you be as one of those spies? I mean, not to cast aspersions on anyone in that profession, but the stereotypes don't expire uh, confidence, right? It could have gone either way. But as Rahab returned to the roof to uncover the spies from their hiding spots, she explained to them why she had risked her life to save theirs. I know that the Lord, she said, has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us, the Amorites, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea, that the reputation preceded them uh, before you were, uh, before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And, and guys, when we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage, no courage remained in any man any longer in this place because of you. For the Lord your God, get this now, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. See, Rahab proclaims that the Hebrew God is God. She also tells them and us that the people of the land knew that the invasion was coming. That They knew of the promises. They, they, were t- they knew to the point where no courage remained in any man any longer because of them. As the sons of Israel came to take back what had been promised to them via the, this covenant with this God that Rahab believed was the God, Rahab did not respond the way her countrymen did. She surrendered. She placed her lives in the hand of these men and the Hebrew God and asked for protection. Now therefore, she said, please swear to me by the Lord. Since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will also deal kindly with not just me, but my father's household and give me a pledge of truth. Deliver our lives from death. And so the two spies promised to spare her life that d- on the day of battle and their lives on the day of battle. They instructed her to tie a scarlet cord to her window so that the Israelite army would know which apartment to spare during the battle. And more than that, They promised to spare the lives of anyone who was with them in the house. And they scaled down the outside of the city walls and escaped out of Rahab's outward-facing window. And so God's grace was extended to a pagan prostitute who knew nothing but the name of Israel's God. Like I said before, Joshua had not encountered a seed yet. So I think he would have been tempted to, convo- to follow the conventional playbook for siege warfare. Except God gave him an unusual plan. This is the part many of you will remember from kids' church, if you grew up in church. They were to march around the city in complete silence every day for six days, and then on the seventh day, they were to march around the city seven times. And then the priests were to blow the horns they had been carrying. Weird, right? Have you ever wondered why the odd tactics? I mean, perhaps it was a psychological scare tactic, right? Except that God makes it clear that he had planned to conquer the city supernaturally right from the start. He said, it shall be when they make a long blast with the ram's horn and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city will fall flat and the people will go up and every man straight ahead. Like the walls will come down. All the people shall shout. The walls will come down with a shout. Not a battering ram, not fire, not like force, with a shout. So if God was going to do some type of God type miracle anyway, why bother with the All of this, with all the parade. I think there were two reasons. One I think is obvious, the other maybe less so. The obvious one is, I think God wanted it to be known that this miraculous happening had nothing to do with their guile or their own kind of cleverness or their own military strength. He wanted it done supernaturally. 
so that it would be known that the God of Israel was with them, that God would get all the credit. (laughs) But I also wonder if, knowing what we know about the grace of God so far, I wonder if he wasn't giving the inhabitants of Jericho six nights to sleep on it and reverse their decision to fight to do as Rahab had done and surrender to this God that they knew was coming to take back an inheritance for his people. Uh, I have very little doubt that had the city officials thrown open the gates and surrendered and repented and abandoned their false gods and embraced Israel's God, that God would have been thrilled. Had there been 10,000 scarlet cords hanging in windows, I think God would have honoured it. During those six days, any number of people could have found refuge in Rahab's quarters. But no one did. No one but Rahab and her family sought God's mercy. And when the walls collapsed, chaos happened. And the Israelite army followed God's instructions to the letter. By the end of the day, nothing and no one were left standing except Rahab, her family, and her possessions. Because of the faith of one Canaanite prostitute, one house was spared. It says the account says, however, Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all she had, Joshua spared. And she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day. Can we just take a moment over that last line? She's lived in the midst of Israel to this day. The storyteller, some years later, but before her death, concludes Rahab's story with this incredible epilogue. She's lived in the midst of Israel even to this day. Under the law recently received by Moses, Moses, uh, she would have been stoned. But she became an accepted member of the community, an adopted daughter of the covenant. And, and by surrendering and receiving God's gracious offer of mercy and forgiveness, she became an adopted daughter in the family of God. But it's better than that because she doesn't just scrape into the pages of history. The Gospel of Matthew reveals that she didn't escape into a second-class citizenship. She didn't have to eat leftover milk and honey. (laughs) Despite her sin-stained past, a young man named Salmon uh, considered her a fine woman of faith, worthy of asking her family to marry her. And Salmon and Rahab gave birth to a son named Boaz. And Boaz maybe even following the example of his courageous and gracious parents, married a dispossessed widow from Moab by the name of Ruth. And Boaz and Ruth became great-grandparents of none other than King David. Rahab. Rahab was no longer Rahab the harlot. (laughs) She was Rahab, the wife of Salmon, or Rahab, the mother of Boaz. And eventually, she would be known as the mother of kings. And the greatest dynasty the world would ever know. And of course, the Messiah, the King of Kings, would be born from her lineage. Now, you might say to me, those of you who've been tracking with us, David, I thought last week you said that the purest form of grace is the grace with, with no strings attached. Didn't Rahab have to do something in order to earn her way into favor? Aha! <laughs> Perhaps. Grace was offered to Rahab and her family. You know, all she had to do was to access it was to believe. In other words, the way she accessed the grace that was offered her was through her faith, through her profession of God's name. And let me tell you this much, what she received was far, far more than what she risked and what she surrendered. That's grace. Grace is always more than enough. So why am I talking about this? Well, it's because that in many ways, Rahab's story is our story. Uh, see, because before Israel showed up, Rahab wore a label. Everybody in the town knew her as Rahab the harlot. The folk in Jericho may not have attached the same kind of, uh, that to that label, the same sort of stigma that we do. But there's no doubt she would have felt the indignity of her occupation. Besides, people typically don't enter that line of work without feeling compelled to It's not often by choice. But when given the choice between dying with her city and surrendering to God, she chose the latter. And as a result of that act of faith, she eventually received a new label, Rahab, the mother of kings. 
just like Rahab, each of us has had a label and your label might be well hidden and you would prefer that it stay that way. Perhaps you avoid reminiscing too much because your memories and your old label cause you shame. In fact, your old label may cause you to shy away from approaching God. It may be the reason why you hesitate to step foot inside a church. If that's you, consider this. When the Israelite spies offered to spare Rahab's life, they said nothing about her lifestyle. (laughs) Remember, she would have been stoned under the law. But they didn't talk about changing what she did. That wasn't part of the deal. The deal was this. She acknowledged Israel's God as the most powerful God and then hid his servants. That was it. Rahab's label didn't get in the way of God's grace. Rahab's label was not an obstacle to God. And neither is yours. You, like Rahab, are invited as you are, label and all. That is the way of grace. Grace doesn't require people with embarrassing labels to shed those labels as a prerequisite. Grace is the thing that empowers us to do so. Grace doesn't demand. Grace assists. And when you look at this story in the context of the nations that it inhabited the promised land, I think that the message is clear. Grace is slow to judge and quick to deliver. On a personal level, when it comes to your labels, current or past, grace is slow to judge and more than willing to deliver. He, he doesn't have to wait until you've freed yourself or distanced yourself from those embarrassing labels. He does it as part of the process. And in its place, grace provides you with labels of its own. Forgiven. Accepted. Loved. And I don't know how long it took Rahab to completely shake the past. I don't know how long it took her to break free of those destructive habits and behaviours. How long it took her to stop identifying with her old life. It was probably a process, right? But it's a process that doesn't end in nothing. It's a process that ends somewhere. It's a journey that ends with her embracing a new life, a new identity and a new standing with God. And just like Rahab... It might take a while before you can put away your label once and for all. But in the meantime, I want to encourage you to begin renewing your mind to the new labels that are yours through your Heavenly Father. If that's you, I would like you to pray with me today to start this journey of leaning into the grace of God. His grace is more powerful than your labels. Jesus paid the penalty for the sin that your label represents. You are forgiven, accepted, and loved. He came to your rescue. That's the way of grace. Pray with me, would you? Father God, I thank you for the way of grace. I thank you that you didn't expect us to shed our labels. We accept today your sacrifice as full payment as full payment for the sin that our labels represent. Lord God, we thank you that you took the penalty of our sin, you took the power of our sin on the cross. We shed those labels by the power of Jesus Christ today and in its place we accept those new labels of grace, forgiven, accepted and loved. Simply by faith today, we receive those things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, thank you for joining us for Church at Home this morning, for spending a couple of moments here with us. Uh, As always, we are keen for you to take a next step in your faith. And so don't just leave this message today. Uh, we, if you are watching this with somebody, we would encourage you to, to uh, have a look at the discussion questions that are following in just a moment. Uh, talk them over. Have a chat with them. Uh, process them together or, or maybe process them after the fact. But do, do have a look at them. Do uh, use them to help you take a next step and lean into the grace of God. Also, we would love for you to join us next week as we gather together. Uh, It is a really good time. And so um, 
as we continue on this way at this journey together following Jesus and leaning into grace I would love it if you came back for church at home or if you're in and around the Yodinga area uh, church in person Uh, but until we see you next God bless you we'll see you next time Thank you.